It's, it's very, All right. Very, yeah. Perfect. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for basically joining this session. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we, I have, like, I, I'm Shekhar Malipadi. I'm the worldwide technology leader for uh, travel and hospitality at AWS. And here I have the privilege of uh, uh, having on the panel uh, Nitin, uh, the CEO of Emphasis, and Jonas uh, from Swissnex. Um, so without further ado, um, Nitin, would you like to introduce yourself and talk about uh, your role and sure. Emphasis? Thanks, Shekhar. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, my name is Nitin Rakesh. I'm the CEO at Emphasis. Uh, Emphasis is a global you know, software services firm headquartered out, dually out of uh, US and India, uh, and primarily focused on driving digital transformation for enterprise uh, you know, 500 customers. Uh, Jonas? Thanks for the invite. I'm Jonas Bernschweig. I am currently the deputy CEO of Swissnex in Boston, about to assume a new role as CEO and Consul General of Swissnex in India. Swissnex um, is a part of the Swiss uh, Science Consulate Network, um, whose mission is to connect Switzerland in education, research, and innovation and facilitate global conversations uh, on, on topics of broad relevance. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nitin and Jonas. Um, so with that in mind, I really want to jump into uh, um, some of the conversations that uh, we want to have here. Um, and the first topic that I want to bring up is this talk about digital transformation, right? If you look at basically, you know, what has happened in the last 25 years uh, with, uh, with uh, the e-commerce and with companies like Amazon, uh, you know, using these capabilities to basically uh, really grow into huge uh, organizations and, and start providing capabilities to their customers. And all of it actually is on the premise of this digital transformation, right? Um, so, so Nitin, uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, Emphasis actually is helping your customers, uh, you know, uh, uh, leverage this new digital front? So, I think, Jacob, the first thing to kind of think about is, uh, you know, what do you really, uh, you know, make of this whole digital revolution, so to speak? And I think, uh, you know, what we did, the first thing we had to do was break it down into some really simplistic constructs, right? Firstly, uh, I think the emergence of a very empowered consumer uh, that is now interacting with every business, every enterprise through this you know, smartphone is really the foundational shift that we've seen in the last 10 years. Uh, as smartphones became you know, ever omnipresent and, and you know, everybody you know, in the developed and the developing world started interacting you know, through, through that interface. That's a non-trivial change for enterprises because enterprises were constructed primarily to engage with clients, you know, you know, their end consumers in a very different construct. Think of a bank. The primary mode of interaction with the bank used to be the bank branch. Yes, we added internet and then we added phone banking, you know, in, in, you know, prior to that. Digital is not just another channel that got added, actually, you know, and as the last 12 months have shown us, digital is not, is actually become the primary channel with which consumers want to interact with the businesses. And I think COVID just put a big spotlight on that. So how do you construct a business model that is digital native? Digit in many cases, it was forced to be digital only for many, many months and still is in many parts of the world, given the, the ongoing crisis. That's a non-trivial shift. And I think what we do really is we work with many large enterprises, banks, insurance companies, retailers, you know, logistics players to effectively understand how do you really, you know, adopt and embrace this change? How do you use technology to drive this business architecture shift? And how do you really construct a business that starts in front of the consumer, understands the consumer expectation, and then actually works backwards to whatever, whatever sits in your back office with your technology estate? So I think digital transformation is, is more than a technology project. It's a different way of thinking about your business architecture. It's a different way of thinking about how do you engage with customers. And along that whole spectrum, you know, how do you really use tech to drive and derive that, that uh, change that you're looking to do? Because every business is today a technology-driven business. But most importantly, every business is a consumer-centric business. And, you know, even if you're a B2B company or a B2B2C company, you have to be able to derive and derive that, that uh, consumer-centric approach. And, and, and we, normally, you know, we, we, we normally tell our clients routinely that uh, it's not about your brand loyalty. You know, your consumers are not loyal only to your brand. They're loyal to your brand and your experience. So how do you really blend those two together? And that's kind of really bulk of what we end up working on with in terms of transformation programs. And, and that involves multiple different streams. It could be an experience, you know, transformation. It could be using data to drive uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, personalization you know, element, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I think th those are, uh, you know, multiple elements of, of the way we think about digital transformation. Okay, uh, thanks, Nitin. Um, so Jonas, so um, so tell me, tell us how 
how you are leveraging the digital transformation to enable um, learning, education, knowledge transfer? Yeah, um, so we're really observing and, and trying to facilitate conversations. So in, in, in my field, in the past six years, I've been in charge of academic relations and um, worked with universities in the higher education sector in particular. And, and I think that what we have experienced in the last year, year and a half is, is the biggest disruption to the field of higher ed in, in our generation. And we could really see uh, that some institutions are a little bit more virtuous and prepared uh, for this digital transformation and, and thought ahead. Uh, while others are lagging behind, and and in in aggregate, I would I would say that what we have experienced in the education sector in the last year is probably the worst of digital transformation. Where we have taken the residential model and have converted it and brought it onto Zoom, because the world was scrambling just to make do uh, with with what needed to happen. Uh, in, instead, what what this shows is that there is a real profound need. Um, to understand these technologies and to think ahead and to try to anticipate some of these changes. And in, in the field of education, that means that we're going to have to see a, a lot more people um, with roles of, uh, say, the instructional designer. If, if you go to, an, to any university nowadays and ask them how many uh, people that respond to the title of instructional designer do you have on staff, uh, the vast majority are going to say none. And, right. and these are really... Um, um, roles that need to be uh, integrated and thought for uh, ahead of time. And if, if we want to go broader um, beyond the, the field uh, of education, uh, you've, you've mentioned that the, uh, Nitin, you've mentioned the, the great advantages that we have with, with e-commerce and the availability to um, purchase anything without having to uh, leave the comforts of our homes. And, and the, you know, I have this beautiful view on the balcony and I can shop anything that I need from here, and that's great. But there, there are drawbacks to that. Uh, on, on one hand, uh, we have access to these experiences. On the other hand, we're giving up something uh, through these technologies. And, and what we at Swiss Next try to do is to facilitate some of these critical conversations um, that try to uh, identify both what is working well, what are and, and what are the pain points? So where, where do we need to improve? And, and if, if uh, on one hand, digital transformation has allowed for a lot of convenience, on, a lot, on the other hand, it has come with a lot of surveillance. Uh, and we have seen over the last years um, some of the prices that we pay in that. And, and we think that we ought to have some conversations to uh, find the right balance between uh, what we can do with technology and what we give up to it. Oh, that's very interesting, uh, Jonas, especially your comment about um, the content that actually is being used for learning is not digitized or not um, not created to basically be uh, delivered remotely. Yeah, that actually is very interesting. And I think I'm, I'm hoping that um, at least in the last one year, what we have learned will change the way uh, remote learning actually would be updated then. Thank you. Um, so moving on to other technologies that we've been talking about, um, there is this there is this new technology, especially quantum computing, that actually has um, been uh, sort of experimented with in the last three, four years. Uh, I think a lot of companies like Microsoft and Google and, and, and Amazon have actually started to basically invest and create this quantum computing capabilities. So um, Nitin, um, so can you talk about quantum computing and how, what your thoughts are on it and how is, uh, more importantly, how is emphasis actually, uh, you know, aligning to to leverage quantum computing in the future? Sure. Happy with that, Trekker. I think uh, we had one more panelist. I think he was trying to join us. I don't know if we can see Brian and if you can let him in. Uh, I, I think... So, uh, all right. I was let me check speaker. that. So, yeah. While, while you do that, uh, let me just uh, give a quick context, at least from our perspective, on the whole quantum... Uh, uh, you know, revolution. I think it's, again, one of those technologies that has been talked about for the past few years, but starting to, I think, get a little bit more mainstream now, especially with all the work that has gone through with some of the hyperscale platforms like like yourselves, uh, Shaker. So what does it really do? What it really does is it provides a, a different paradigm in which you can actually get access to a, an order of magnitude higher computing power. And that, current, you know, if, you, if a normal uh, compute task was going to take you eight hours, you probably can crunch that down into 15 or 20 minutes. What that means is our ability to solve complex problems that require that level of you know, compute uh, is, uh, is much higher. And now we can start thinking about uh, you know, crunching data 
you know, of course, you know, there are other ways to, to, to accelerate that process using machine learning, using automation. And I think that was done very, very successfully, even in the, in the production of the, the, the coronavirus vaccine. But if you start thinking about, you know, uh, complex problems like drug discovery, route optimization, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, you know, fraud detection, uh, you know, combine the ele- the ability to crunch high amounts of data with very high compute power. And you're then starting to, to think about, you know, creating these new use cases uh, that can benefit a lot from uh, from this whole quantum revolution. So I think, again, early stages, and as we normally say, you know, we uh, in technology always disappoints in the short run, but, uh, or, or, you know, we, we, we underestimate the impact in the long run. This is, is one of those long tail technology, you know, revolutions that will actually really move the ball forward in terms of the ability to use compute uh, and, uh, and, and and crunch data that requires very high, high powers of compute. So right now we are, we are looking at use cases around the cases that I just talked about, right? Fraud detection, route optimization, uh, you know, drug discovery, uh, you know, the whole, can we, can we crunch the timeline required to, to, to discover new drugs and bring it down from years to, to months and weeks? Uh, and those are, I would say, some of the early cases that that are being worked upon right now. Yeah. I don't think we can hear you, Saker. Yeah, I think you're muted. Can't hear you. I guess it is meant to happen that in a panel discussion, leveraging everybody connecting through technology, we have one or two points of failure. I know. So maybe you want to unmute and uh, mute and unmute again. Check it. See if that works. We should all really have invested into becoming lip readers. <laughs> Jonas, why don't, why don't you go ahead with your thoughts on on the same topic? Meanwhile, yeah, if, if Secretary absolutely. Back so, uh, I I have to I have to start with the premise that I have uh, no expertise whatsoever on on quantum computing, um, and so I speak from the perspective of a generalist that again is in a position to try to facilitate conversations, and um, we we do have the fortune of of having uh, some world-renowned uh, research facilities in Switzerland in the field of quantum computing. So we, we have seen uh, um, the, the occasional researchers come through our Swiss next doors. But I have to say that the, the most interesting exposure that I had to the quantum world was a couple of years ago when I was in Sierra Leone in, in West Africa working in uh, the newly formed Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation there. And they had this aspiration and vision to uh, develop the world's first governmental quantum encrypted network. And uh, what I find fascinating about that is uh, that you're applying a technology that, that is uh, obviously ahead of its time. We're, we're just uh, at, in the very early stages of this. And, and we're seeing uh, players outside uh, the mainstream or off the beaten path. Uh, you, you would not go to a place like Sierra Leone to, to expect to have a conversation about quantum computing. But I think that is actually something very important and relevant in here, um, in, in this conversation to ensure that that these technologies uh, um, are accessible in a way and and that um, disparate players around the world have a chance of of leveraging some of the possibilities uh, and the applications uh, that that you have described in uh, I, I think are right on i mean it's 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 going to be very interesting to see how we, through quantum computing we can accelerate um, what uh, at the the current time um, is taking a little bit longer, but we we should say that I mean the, the the computing power with which we operate now in the pre quantum era is already remarkable. So we're just again, it's an exponential phase. Uh, it's it's incredible. Okay. Hey guys, can you hear me now? 
Yes. Yes. All right. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, sorry about that. Um, so thank you so much for keeping the conversation going <laughs> while I had to manage my uh, uh, audio issues. Um, so moving on to the next one. Um, so one of the enablers that actually has has become very very prominent in the last uh, you know five six years or so is the whole cloud computing. So Nitin, um, can you talk a little bit of, about how Emphasis is leveraging the cloud capabilities uh, to help your customers? I think, uh, you know, it's again, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, phase that we're living through, uh, Shaker. I mean, think about, uh, at a very fundamental level, what we're seeing with cloud is the, you know, cre creating a utility out of computing power, right? Uh, dial back the clock 100 years, right, when, when power was being, uh, you know, getting much more mainstream, right? I'm talking about electricity, right? Uh, we, you know, almost everybody, every block had a power plant, every factory had a power plant outside, uh, you know, and, and over the early nine, 1900s, we, or maybe late, late 1800s, early 1900s, we saw electrification of the world at a very rapid pace, uh, you know, with, with the uh, creation of, uh, you know, utility power plants and alternate current, you could actually manufacture power transmitted over long distances using electric lines. Uh, you know, the whole ACDC revolution was, was very much part of that. I think we're living through something very similar with compute power. Anybody who needed computing capability had to have a power plant. We used to call it the data center <laughs> within their operation, in the bank, in the facility, in the factory, you know, in the insurance company. Anybody who needed to crunch, you know, need compute had to, had to put up a, a data center. We are going through a phase where compute power is becoming a utility and it's getting bundled with things like storage, security network, and available on tap right now because all you need is a fiber optic connection. And that's the, just like you had electricity connection coming in through wires, you have fiber optic connection bringing you compute power. So again, I'm really, you know, trying to oversimplify this, but that's effectively what we are seeing going on in the world with cloud computing. It's not in the cloud, it's sitting somewhere, except that you don't need to own that compute, you know, power plant. You can just plug and play. And that has some really, you know, big implications for the way people consume technology and, and they spend their money. They typically spend money in buying hardware, provisioning it, putting it in the data center, then buying telecom capacity and then using that, that compute power, you know, that was captive. So I think the, the ability to get a lot more nimble, agile, higher resilience, higher security, all of that kind of come together in with this cloud revolution. Uh, and it also requires significant you know, architectural and mindset shift for enterprises to move away from owning and controlling everything to actually using everything on on demand pay as you go you know if you bundle that alongside you know all the extremely you know high uh, sophistication and, and automation that is native to these cloud platforms you have some really potent tools that actually can give us the ability to to use compute power in a way that we can actually become a lot more consumer centric versus a lot more infrastructure centric in our thinking, you know, of how to apply technology. So I think right. that the journey that we are seeing the enterprise world go through, uh, you know, as always, there are multiple iterations, but what COVID has done is accelerated that journey by three to five years. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we wrote a paper back in 2017 and we said uh, for enterprises, data center of the future is an empty room. And we now hear almost every client of ours basically say they want to get, get out of the data center business. Uh, you know, they don't want to own real estate. They don't own hardware. They don't own software. They don't want to refresh it. Uh, and I think that's that's a very fascinating fundamental shift and pivot that we are seeing, uh, you know, going through right now. Right, right. Um, so, so Nitin, a follow up question on that one. Um, so, I think a year ago, a year and a half ago, before COVID nineteen, I think um, there was a lot of reluctance. Now, I think uh, what you're seeing, and we are seeing the same thing in the travel and hospitality industry, is adoption at a higher pace. Um, but what else is? What else are the? Are there any other blockers? that are still preventing companies basically from going to the cloud. Uh, what are you seeing uh, with your customers? There are, um, again, like all things, and every time you, you industrialize a new technology you know, or a new platform, you go through um, multiple phases of adoption. I think the first phase of adoption was well, uh, security. I need to own my data. It, it has to sit in my, in my four walls. Uh, and I think that's a big, that used to be a huge stumbling block for especially all regulated industries. Uh, I don't think it's it's gone away, but I think there is an there is an increasing you know realization that uh, you actually probably get a higher level of security. Uh, you can do a colo combination combined with the public cloud, uh, and I think there are models that are emerging that are at least 
uh, con- you know, getting past that big reluctance in this big area. And I think there is also emergence of regulation and evolution of the regulatory environment around that framework as well. Right. Second framework really also is just because you're going to get rid of your infrastructure uh, and consume cloud doesn't mean that it's actually cheaper to do it. I think so. What's the cost benefit? Uh, I think there's a significant amount of work that has gone in over the last you know, 12, 18 months in understanding what the right architectural framework should be. So you don't end up uh, you know, moving in a way that you create more tech debt. And I think that's something that we, you know, a lot of our clients, you know, in their early iterations, they 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 tried to lift and shift. Uh, you know, I think that's being rethought through as well. So there's a combination of some commercial issues, security issues, and technical issues. But you know, working through those is kind of really where firms like us come in, and and uh, uh, we're we're trying to really you know work closely with clients in kind of addressing a combination of these these uh, issues. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nitin. So, Jonas. So, um, so how how is the educational uh, and knowledge uh, industry uh, leveraging the cloud? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I can say that for us specifically, we're we're fortunate in in that we don't have to deal with this headache too much because as a government entity, um, we the the government regulations are very wary of of taking things uh, into cloud computing and they prefer to have their their own uh, in-house solutions um so we ourselves as an organization uh, are are sort of outside of this but of course observing what is happening um it is quite interesting nitin as you as you were talking uh, about um sort of this pay for play um and and outsourcing part of the the infrastructure, the critical digital infrastructure um, to um, large companies comes with enormous opportunities, uh, which which you've outlined. Um, but it also comes uh, with with some setbacks because it means that we have fewer players. We depend on fewer players uh, um, to um, have that computing, cloud computing power that we need. And the vulnerabilities that come with that uh, are uh, centralized. Uh, we have a more centralized system rather than a decentralized one. And uh, the ability to absorb shocks, um, let's let's see where that goes. I mean, I, I don't know if you woke up this morning to the news that uh, part of the web was down. Um, that, that's the other side uh, uh, of, of this coin. Right. Um, but what is interesting about this, it's it's a model that is not just seen in, in cloud computing. Nitin, as you were talking, I thought about um, the, the model of, of Lab Central, which is a life sciences accelerator based in Boston that has been enormously successful in that it provided wet lab research space uh, to startups coming out of the research labs of the universities, essentially um, externalizing and outsourcing the whole operations and the headache that small companies have to go through when they just want to do the science. They just want to focus on what they're strong and uh, let somebody else figure out uh, the whole uh, architecture, infrastructure, whether it's digital or physical. Right. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Okay. And and of course, the way the way in which that was disrupted by everybody being remote and at home in the last year—that's another question. The, the cloud world ha- has has had a boon, and the physical world has had a boon. Right. Excellent. Um, thanks, Jonas. Um, so. Talking upon the same lines, uh, so Jonas, uh, one of the challenges uh, uh, with the, um, this all these new technologies we're talking about is basically the adoption and how do you adopt to it. And um, what we are seeing is a huge gap in skills and capabilities uh, in these new technologies. Can you talk a little bit about what you and your organization and your industry is doing to basically reduce the skills gap and uh, and uh, how do you basically teach people about these new capabilities and technologies so that they can actually go and then be successful on these new technologies? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. And um, we try to think about it at the systems level because right. uh, as SwissNext is an organization that has five outposts around the world in, in uh, knowledge nodes uh, that, that are at the frontiers of knowledge in different fields, um, I had the privilege in the last six years of, of observing uh, how the frontiers of higher ed in the in the Northeast and the greater Boston area uh, go about this. And and you, you really want to look at it from a systems and the leadership's perspective, because what it takes is um, leaders that uh, understand these technologies, that understand um, that institutions need to adapt and change. And, and the question to people uh, in 
in, in the decision making seat is uh, do you want to lead anticipate um, what is happening changes being the only constant or uh, do you want to sit comfortable because you're part of a system that more or less works uh, and, and you just uh, adapt and adjust and uh, the disruption caused by COVID has really shown that those who think ahead and, and uh, are more resilient and prepared for different kinds of scenarios and try to anticipate uh, some of the things that um, are coming um, tend to be better off. Um, and the same can be said uh, for people in uh, various parliaments around the world. If, if we uh, quizzed people in, in parliaments in, in most countries of the world on, on their digital literacy and their understanding of uh, the technologies uh, that they are in a position to regulate and uh, that they're in a position to govern, um, we'd be shocked at uh, how uh, limited the understanding of these technologies often is and uh, that needs to change. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you, Jonas. Um, so Nitin, so can you talk about um, what are the challenges with technology adoption? I think it's not as simple as, you know, having the capabilities or, or the new technology, but, you know, how do you go about, um, how do you say, um, operationalizing it or, uh, you know, and practicalities of implementing new technologies? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, Sekhar. I think, uh, you know, this fortunately or unfortunately, there is this new shiny toy syndrome that takes over every time there is a new piece of tech that comes about. And uh, I think uh, I, I kind of used this phrase earlier, but, you know, almost everybody, you know, uh, tends to overestimate the impact of tech in the short run and underestimate the impact in the long run, right? So we go through these hype cycles where we actually go through a phase of great new shiny toy, high expectations, then we go through a phase of, you know, expectations were not met, it's a failed technology, and then, of course, it comes back and, you know, in a way, uh, changes the world. Look at, you know, internet with e-commerce, right? We went through this massive boom in the late 90s, early 2000s. Then we had a big bust. And then here we are today where, you know, five of the biggest companies in the world were born in that era, right? So uh, I think uh, it's a little bit of that that similar thinking with almost every new tech with the hype cycle. Uh, I think the, the the advice we give to our clients is uh, is very simply, what is it that you're looking to do for as a, you know, as a business? You know, work backwards from where your business and your consumers are and then think about, you know, using tech you know, in, in an applied manner that gives you the best impact from that perspective. Of course, we have big proponents for having an experimentation mindset, you know, experiment, 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 do it across horizons, use technology across horizons. But I don't think it's always about using the new shiny toy. One, one tech is not going to change things overnight. Right. Uh, I mean, we can say the same with things like data, with cloud computing. We, we can say the same about quantum computing. Uh, so, so I think multiple different, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, phases. Uh, of course, the, time, the, the the hype cycles are, are are reducing because of the acceleration with the S curve that we are seeing the exponentiality of the curve. Uh, but I think uh, almost every piece of tech, you know, from robotics to I mean, we, robots have been around since the since the late eighties, right? And we still don't have a robot that can become our housekeeper, right? Is that a failed tech? Well, I think it's a failed expectation. Uh, similarly, I think uh, you know we, we, it's fascinating to, to if you go back and read just the issue, old issues of Wired magazine. It's amazing to see what the cover stories were and, and how that played out. And in many cases, you know, you did see that the, many other technologies came back and, and became really, really big. Now, of course, not everything is the same level of uh, impact. Uh, and I think that's where businesses have to create that ecosystem where they have an experimentation mindset. They can go through, uh, you know, adaptive experimentation and identify where they're seeing success and then scale those programs versus where they're not seeing success. I think right. that's, that's the way we think about it a little bit. I think our, our, our construct almost always is applied tech. Can we apply it? Can we improve something? How do we make sure that we have this, you know, skunk work set up to to take all the innovation and actually apply that to real businesses? Right. Okay. Um, so, Nitin, can you talk also about a little bit about the short term, long term, um, you know, approach to new technologies? Yeah, I think uh, I briefly referred to this, you know, innovation across horizons. Uh, I think don't just look at uh, what you need today because you know if you if you only you know play catch up, then you're you're always going to be, uh, you know, in a uh, you know, in, in that catch-up mode. But I think the ability to look around corners, the ability to think at what could be that next, you know, piece of tech that can be disruptive to your business or in some cases, uh, you know, be, be extremely accretive to the way you run, run your business is important, right? That's why, uh, you know, creating this adaptive experimentation mindset where you, where you actually seed multiple different experiments and apply tech, tech across multiple different lines of business 
and then using that outcome as a as a as a great way to to then you know further fund these programs i think it requires a slightly different you know if if enterprises have the have a fear of failure we're not going to succeed with adoption of tech but that's a biggest stumbling block in in application of tech so uh, i think that's where uh, you know agility and 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 really using this uh, uh, this adaptive experimentation mindset becomes extremely key all right, that's excellent, uh, Nintin. Um, so one thing that actually is, uh, is is sort of the back of a lot of people's mind is regarding all these legacy technologies. We talked a lot about new technologies, cloud, cloud computing, all these great capabilities, but there are still a lot of applications uh, that are still on legacy technologies. So Nitin, can you talk a little bit about you know how are how are you and Emphasis dealing with that? And how are you enabling your customers to, you know, adapt or um, the, the legacy technologies to the new new technologies and sure. cloud? Yeah, again, I think, Chekhar, we go back to the same, you know, uh, uh, true north, which is uh, what is the best way for us to impact the business? What is the business looking to shift it towards, right? If the business is looking to shift towards being more consumer centric, uh, you can't just wish away the fact that you've been in business for the last 30, 40 years and you've built up this large technology estate. That was much needed and, and actually runs your business even today, right? Right. How do you shield that consumer away from this legacy uh, without having to think about the fact that that legacy is going to weigh, is weighing you down? Because changing that legacy is not practical. Neither do you have the money to do it, nor do you have the risk appetite to do it in, in any short time frame. Uh, so I think this construct of, you know, start in front of the consumer, intermediate, disintermediate the consumer from the, you know, comp, you know the lack of a flexibility that the, that the legacy offers you. And the real answer is use data and experience, you know, as an as a as an intermediary layer to drive that experience. And, right. and again, it goes back to the the whole cloud native data platforms, uh, you know, that that have now come about. Uh, of course, it's a journey, but right. can you do it iteratively? Can you start seeing, you know, can you start shrinking that legacy footprint so you don't have to go to the core system, you don't have to go to the mainframe for every database call, every query? Simple example, right? If you query the balance in your bank account, it shouldn't be something that is going to the mainframe and creating a new query on the mainframe. Right. That's really how you, you you weigh down by legacy. But can you actually create a transient you know data store and then use the data store to drive experience and give this quote unquote real time feel that the consumer is expecting, right? And then at some point you will have you know you would have shrunk the legacy enough iteratively, right? Do it right. every two months, every three months. You would have shrunk it enough to be able to actually then transform it. I think that's the process a lot of large enterprises are undertaking. Okay. Uh, it's non-trivial because in the end, uh, you know, that legacy is where the heart and soul of the business sits. It's a system of record. That's where you keep your books. That's where you have your account balances. You cannot afford for that to go down for even for even for a minute. Resilience is high. Needed is high. And by the way, those systems are built for scale. They're built for performance. What they're not built for is flexibility and customer centricity because right. they were not required to do that, right? Who was dealing with the customer? A human being in the branch, right? right. The way to personalize was private banker. It was never to do with technology. So I think we are expecting the legacy to do something it's not meant to do. It's right. a business architecture shift, not a technology issue. Right? right. That's where you're going to blend these two together. Yep. I think I think that's that's a great observation, and I think I have it's in the travel and hospitality space we have seen that happen over the last twenty years. Um, so uh, uh, an example analogy to that would be a reservation system that actually is operated by a travel agent versus um, you know in the with the digital transformation for the last twenty years, customers actually want to search and book themselves. Um, and and the whole interaction is changed, so the mainframes actually could not keep up. And what the airlines and some of the hotel companies have done is do exactly what you're talking about, which is move all the reads away from the mainframe yeah. to a much more scalable system. Um, and that's how basically they have they have you know created how do you say um, the capabilities of the customer around the edge on yeah. top of the mainframe, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a great pattern, and I think. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, before the cloud, uh, that actually was what is called system of reference or the operational data stores and how they did it. But what cloud is doing is it even is making um, um, the ability to build those ODSs much cheaper, better, faster. That way, you can actually innovate even more. So it's very interesting. Uh, uh, so, so um, innovate around the edge, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so thank you so much for that uh, uh, insight, um, Jonas. Any thoughts on on? Uh, on legacy, uh, uh, whether it actually is education systems or actually even uh, training and enablement uh, to get around that. Yeah, I, I really echo a comment that Nitin made that this is, it's not made for customization and, and um, it, it, 
it was installed in a specific context and that's what it was meant for. And I think what's really interesting is um, as technologies are being upgraded and, and legacy technology and, and you're stuck with some legacy technology and thinking what to do, um, particularly when, when you're in, in an advanced economy uh, where the resources are not scarce, uh, that legacy technology often finds its way into a lower income context uh, where uh, you you might think, oh, this is great. Now you get to upgrade uh, another place's uh, technology with something that they didn't have access to before. And uh, there, there's the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> you, you, you would find more examples of, of great legacy equipment sitting dormant in, in some place where it could really be used, but it's not used because the... It, the, it doesn't meet the local conditions, whether it's climatic, whether it's the instruction manual is not in the right language, whether the the, the spare parts uh, are, are not available. So if, if you look at this again uh, from the perspective of a global system, um, we, we have yet to figure out how to leverage what we have and how to use and reuse what we have in, in, a, in a much, much better way. There, there is enormous opportunity and, and for, for those who are entrepreneurially minded to, to try to bridge that gap and use legacy technologies in, in high income contexts and, and repurpose and find ways to uh, adapt them in a way that actually works and makes sense uh, right. in, in more resource constrained areas. Big opportunity there, but also big challenge. Hey, that's a very interesting perspective, Jonas. You know, how do you leverage legacy technologies, right? Yeah, so that's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, so moving on, a um, couple of other thoughts, uh, a couple of other discussions, um, um, especially regarding cybersecurity. Uh-oh. Maybe we lost you again. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, audio gone again. <laughs> okay, now you know what to do. <laughs> Jonas, now that we know that he's talking about cyber security, why don't you take yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, why, why don't you start since you're uh, you're no. more embedded in the in in the field and and it affects you more directly? No, I think it affects uh, all of us because in the end, all of us have uh, uh, information out there that needs to be protected. And, and I think the interesting thing to note is that uh, the whole construct of cyber is uh, welcome hey. back, Baker. Hey. Hey. Yeah. All right. All these challenges, I guess. So, um, so the question I was going to ask is about cybersecurity uh, and uh, with uh, some of this news about ransomware and other things that are going on. So, uh, so we can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the new challenges cybersecurity, especially with uh, quantum computing, uh, and uh, you know what what are your thoughts on that, and uh, more importantly, what is, what is emphasis uh, thinking about in this area? I think that's a conversation topic that is top of mind for every board, every risk chair, and uh, of course, every CEO. Uh, it's the one thing that gives uh, people sleepless nights. Uh, the recent shift from stealing data to creating ransoms is obviously a, a pretty scary trend. Uh, I'm glad they were able to to block this whole crypto wallet that you know this recent ransomware did yesterday. So. I think uh, the more we can do about it, the less it is. There are only two types of companies in the world, ones that get hacked and ones that know that they got hacked. Uh, so I think with that mindset, what you have to really, really do is create the ability to uh, react very, very nimbly to any time you actually have a breach. Uh, create, you know, and I think bulk of it starts with making sure that you have no vulnerabilities because given that we are running a mishmash of technologies in our, uh, in our, in our infrastructure, that's what creates the vulnerability. So I think... Uh, you know, I'm a believer that you know going to hyperscale platforms is actually more secure than less. I'm also the believer that the biggest risk to cyber is the people risk. Uh, you know, the bulk of the attacks are are people related weaknesses, and uh, you know somebody had a really poorly designed password, somebody clicked on a link that wasn't supposed to be clicked on, uh, and of course, you know there are some very creative ways in which uh, you know these professionals are operating. Uh, you know, in a way that you know the, the, that is a very sophisticated criminal criminal world. So uh, I think our advice to clients almost always is to is to focus on, uh, you know, how quickly can you respond? How do you make sure that you have you create more security? And I think uh, the, the 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 quantum combined with cyber is an opportunity and a threat combined together because you can actually decrypt really pretty much any password using quantum. But at the same time, you know, you actually can also encrypt using quantum. So I think it's a it's a race to the fish line. You know whether the good guys get there first or not, and I think uh, we, we are investing in a, in a in a cyber initiative alongside Quantum at the University of Calgary, 
we just announced it last week, that will hopefully do a lot more work in, in, in that particular area. So I think that's the way we're thinking about it. But it is definitely, uh, uh, you know, an area where, you know, the, the number of, uh, you know, incidents and, and risks have kind of gone up pretty much as exponentially as the computing power is going up last 12, 18 months. Okay, excellent. So, Jonas, any thoughts on that uh, from uh, from uh, your point of view? Well, if, if I could make a sure bet, I'd say that we're going to see a lot more chief security officers and chief security architects um, being added to organizations. But that that is just to state the obvious. Right. Um, well, education actually here again can play a very important part because I completely agree with the team. There, there are those who get hacked and know it, and there are those that just don't know it. But everybody, everybody's susceptible to it. Right. And and education again is it's a big part. Uh, so we're working with uh, on on a executive training right now in science diplomacy, and one of our collaborators is uh, Larry Suskind at MIT, and he teaches a course on cybersecurity for critical infrastructure which uh, essentially is training um, people in, in infrastructure like dams uh, and, and other areas of, of, sort of urban planning that make the world go round, how to deal with these vulnerabilities, how to negotiate uh, when the time comes, if and when the time comes and, and you've been hacked and there's a ransomware uh, happening. We're, we're going to see a lot more of that. And preparedness right. is, is, again, one part of the answer. Right. Because you can't eliminate it, right? So, so Jonas, on that topic, right? So, as been talked about a lot of times, the vulnerability comes from people, um, right? So, any thoughts on how to educate the broader non-technical audience so that they know not to click on a on a link than they're supposed to? So, any thoughts on that? Like, you know, because um, you need to sort of educate the lower end of the tech, uh, uh, of the spectrum of the people that don't know technology, but they but they are the ones that actually would let people in, right? I, I wish I had a magic wand. I think arm yourselves with patience because I think we've all talked with a relative or a friend who is uh, not tech savvy and, and, and try to explain to them why they need to pick a, a password that reflects certain <laughs> characteristics. And and there, there's no simple answer, but arm okay. yourself with patience and, and uh, do the good work. Right. Right. Um, so we have a couple more minutes left. So um, I really want to basically touch upon a topic, uh, which is what I call democratization of knowledge. Right. If you see what's happening for the last three or you know, five or 10 years, you see a lot of these amazing universities, premium universities that are offering courses, actually, that are almost free to anybody in the world. Right. Uh, and then combine that with the fact that, you know, all this upskilling and new technologies are coming up and there's a need basically to educate yourself uh, all the time with a lifelong learning as actually a requirement. So, Jonas, any thoughts on, you know, what, what are you thinking about uh, in this area? Uh, what, are, what is this next doing in this area? Yeah, that, that is fantastic. I think that that is a very important uh, question. I think uh, universities are going to evolve from degree granting institutions to degree granting institutions plus uh, that uh, will enter the business of uh, reskilling, retooling, upskilling right. um, with, with uh, micro courses um, and micro credentials that uh, leverage uh, the, the digital uh, technology. The, the beauty of, of platforms like edX and Coursera, it's be clear to everybody uh, how, how amazing it is that you can have access to uh, a world-class education um, anywhere you have access to connectivity. So if anything, the challenge, again, is more on ensuring that people who could benefit the most from accessing these platforms uh, have the broadband and the connectivity uh, and the devices right. through which they, they can uh, reach uh, all of the knowledge that is already available to anybody. Okay. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, so, uh, so Nitin, um, I know that you guys have some really amazing platforms in emphasis about learning, lifelong learning. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, no, I think uh, we took a call uh, three or four years ago that, uh, you know, just like we expect, uh, you know, almost every experience in business to be uh, digitized, we have to also digitize the whole learning experience and personalize it. So we built up a whole Talent Next platform that effectively puts every employee in the middle of that learning and it's highly digitized. Uh, Highly personalized, and of course, we are using all the the platforms that uh, uh, that Jonas talked about. So, I think how do you scale it? How do you roll it out? We we've just taken that whole same platform, same thinking, 
and we're going to apply it actually at a city le- city level in Calgary in Canada. We just announced that last week uh, because we're trying to drive the tri- tech transformation in partnership with the University of Calgary. So I think that's a right. large scale, uh, you know, implementation and a use case of this digitized learning platform where university is partnering with us and we actually have this. On the supply side, we have talent that is available on the oil and gas sector. On the demand side, we have talent that is needed on the digital sector. How do you kind of bring these two together? And I think it will be a fascinating journey over the next 12 eight months to see how that gets rolled out. Wow, that actually is really great to hear. Um, so again, um, we're at the end of the uh, session. So thanks again, uh, Nitin, for joining us uh, from a perspective of uh, uh, an enabler like an emphasis talking about new technologies, but also very interested to have Jonas actually from an education knowledge point of view to talk about uh, enabling these new technologies. So glad to have you guys on the panel. It was a great discussion and amazing uh, points, basically, that uh, that you both have provided. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, we'll actually end this session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.